All right. So thank you guys. We're so excited to have our first Campus Connections Part 2 program here at the school. And so if you were here in the school in the fall, we had Campus Connections Part 1 where we had about maybe 12 or 15 uh, current college students from the class of 2020 and 2021 come and talk to us and give us their best advice about college, how to navigate through college, and just a whole bunch of other, um, you know, good tea. And so now we have them back because it's the end of the year. They have another semester under their belt. So now they're experts. And also there are just some things that you guys need to do to get ready for school between now and the fall. So some of these topics that they're going to be talking about are not gonna be as exciting or tantalizing as some of the other information that they gave you in the fall. But these items that they're gonna give you are items that you truly need so that you can kind of set yourself up for success. So what I wanna do is just kind of go and have everyone introduce themselves. Um, let us know your name, where you're in school, what class you're in, your major. Um, and then we do have a VIP in the house. We have an old, old head in the house and he can introduce himself as well. So we'll start with you, Yukami. Okay, so my name is Yukami and I go to Penn State Berks. My major is kind of currently undecided and um, that's pretty much it. Okay, and did you say what class you were in? Oh, class of 2021. Okay. All right, Beatrice. Uh, hello, I'm Beatrice Arcala. I'm also class of 2021. I'm currently at Princeton. And as of now, I'm uh, majoring in molecular biology, but that may change. All right, that's an interesting may change. We're gonna make sure we put a pin in that. I couldn't put a pin on the screen, but we can put a pin in that. All right, all right, Jamie. I'm Jamie, uh, class of 2021, and I attend Chestnut Hill College. Uh, right now, I'm an English major with um, secondary education as my uh, minor. Okay, and then the last time I talked to you, Jamie, you were looking at making a little move. Are you still going to be at Chestnut Hill, or are you making a move? Well, there was a there was a change in my coaching staff, and you know, talking to some of my teammates, I'm going to stick it out and you know, stay local. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And that's, you know, that's a good move too, because if you, you know, everybody knows when you try to move to another school, the credits become that big issue. Okay. So we'll come back to that too. You guys can talk about that. All right. Miss Gabrielle. Um, hi, my name is Gabby. I graduated with the class of 2021. Um, I'm currently at Kutztown University and majoring in elementary education. All right. All right. All right. And then last, but definitely not least, we have Mr. Christopher Jaramillo. Good evening, buena tarde, Cristobal Jaramillo. Um, I am class of a long time ago, um, and I am currently in admissions with Montgomery County Community College. It's a pleasure to be here. And also he is a member of our school board as well, uh, but he spends a lot of time in our building um, uh, with some Marco stuff. So we've gotten a lot of FaceTime this year, so. He is now extra, extra in the family. So I also thank you for coming um, because he's gonna be able to answer all the questions that we can't answer and add some additional insight. Um, and so we just like to thank our guests that are here today. And so we're gonna ask some questions, but you, you guys can also feel free to drop questions in the chat because we are doing this program for you guys. Um, so I'm just gonna just start with the first main question. Um, that I had for you guys because I know that you know right now students have paid their deposits they're kind of checking in with their um, uh, admissions officer to kind of figure out who their advisors are and start trying to figure out how to pay this bill that they have coming up so um, what suggestions um, after the student has paid their deposits what do you guys is uh, what do you guys uh, suggest for their next steps that they need to do. I know that was a long time ago for y'all, but 
Anybody want to go first? As far as giving advice about, let's say um, they, they have to do this master promissory note. Can somebody kind of give us some information about what that is? You know, when you guys had to go on there and do the loan, that, that was a long time ago. Y'all were so old. So the master promissory note is when you guys have to go in there and read all the information on the FAFSA about what loans are, when you have to pay them back. All right, let me just explain what it is. Because <laughs> I know some of y'all have loans. So you guys are going to get some information in your portal about, you know, your bill, how much you owe, how much you're able to take out in loans. And so there's something called a master promissory note that you will have to complete. And so you have to go onto your FAFSA account, read some information. I think there's also some videos on there so that they can explain to you how your credit is going to work. And it also on your FAFSA will show you how much you have borrowed and you know how much you're accruing. I believe interest may also be on there as well. I don't know if it's the principal balance or the principal and the interest, but it does keep track of that. So you have to do that at the beginning of your borrowing process and then at the end of college, um, you have another thing that you have to read and fill out so that you can understand how this is paid back. So I know I've skipped some stuff. So I don't know if Mr. Hamia has some insight in there too. Um, you touched a, a lot of good points there. Um, I'm not sure if you wanted me to like insert my own experience with that sort of thing. Um, Cause that could, I can go into to depth about that. Um, I'm more than happy to do so, should you wish. Um, but those are pretty much the, the highlights of it. Um, you know, you you as a student will typically receive financial aid. Um, in addition to that, uh, or I guess within that, um, your buckets of money, I guess we could call it, will include like an unsubsidized loan, a subsidized loan. Um, and knowing what the difference is between those two and how those could impact you and your education and um, credit wise, et cetera. And then, of course, within other buckets of money, you'll typically receive um, scholarships if you apply to them and or grants um, should you apply to them as well. Um, give me just a moment. I have somebody knocking on my door. That's okay. Since he stepped away for a second, I'm going to jump to a different topic. Um, students are going to have to buy books for classes, right? So, uh-oh, Gabrielle's ready to talk about that. So what is your best advice on how to buy books? What books should you buy, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, so do not buy books until like after, like you went to class and you know you're absolutely going to have to use that book because I bought all my books like as soon as I got to campus and didn't really like, go to any of my classes and be like oh like do I really need this book so I just bought all these books and just basically wasted my money because some of the books I really didn't need um so some of the books like your professors are going to recommend and say like oh you don't absolutely need to use this but like it's a good resource okay you can buy it but um don't buy it unless you necessarily need it because I wasted my money now, Kutztown also has um, like a digital format. So we also had our books online, which were a lot cheaper. Um, but that also goes hand in hand with don't buy them unless um, you absolutely need them. So. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and read your syllabus. You need to read the syllabus because I know that this past semester I had a situation where there were certain uh, there were certain books and due dates and stuff that I needed that I didn't really know what I needed. So it's like read your syllabus and you know actually pay attention in class because your teachers are gonna say like little things and you might miss it and then you know boom you didn't drop two hundred dollars on a book and books are really expensive for college. Like I got a two hundred dollar book stipend and it still barely covered my books. So it's like, look for the cheapest option if you can, like look for, you know, somebody like an upperclassman that already had the book or even going online. I found a lot of online options and Amazon always. So when you say online book options, is Amazon the only choice or what are the other spots that you guys can look at? So like what Gabby was saying, we also have like a digital library. So 
you're able to go in and buy the books. Like at the bookstore, they'll ask you if you want it, you know, uh, paperback or if you want it um, digital and you have the option. And there's plenty of like, there's plenty of like uh, websites for books that I didn't even know existed. And so like I was, you know, looking for the books. So there's plenty of, there's plenty of like websites and sources. You just kind of got to look for them. And then you also mentioned a syllabus. Mm. What is a syllabus? You said what is a syllabus? I don't, I don't know the proper definition of it, but I know that it's like your, it's like you're kind of like your rundown for the semester or for the marking period. All your uh, assignments, all your, uh, you know, due dates and everything, the, uh, your grading level, like how, you're, how you'll be scored that semester and all sorts of stuff is found in, you know, a sort of packet kind of they'll give you. And so, yeah, it kind of is like your intro to the class, along with the teacher giving you the intro, but it's more like a formal written intro. Um, so if I could jump in. Um, the syllabus also has like the office hours, the grading system, because different professors use different grading systems. So like the one time I emailed my professor like something about a grade and he was like referred to the syllabus. And uh, of course, I didn't save the syllabus, so it was like lost, but definitely refer back to the syllabus. But also going back to textbooks, um, Che and Amazon have um, are really good websites to use. Um, I do recommend renting the book if you could. I know you could rent it through the bookstore like on campus or you could do it through Che. Um, I did it the second semester and it definitely was a lot better because you didn't have to pay for like the full book and actually buy it. So you could just rent it and send it back. So it was really easy to do that as well. Yeah, I think for more um, like generally used books such as like chemistry, like general chemistry books or like um, biology textbooks, they do have um, like online PDFs of them. So I did buy like all my books, all my textbooks, but I didn't actually end up using the paper copy of it. Um, I instead downloaded the PDF and like I used it, like I read it off like an iPad. Um, so I would definitely like recommend looking for them online before you even like consider purchasing them. You guys are giving some great advice about renting books because when I was in school, we didn't, we couldn't rent books. You either bought new books or old books or borrowed somebody else's books. So those are uh, really great tips. What books, and I already know the answers to this, but what subjects have the most expensive books? Or what majors have the most expensive books? Um, I know for me, it was psychology. Um, that book was at least $150. And I took a beginner Spanish course and it was all online and it was, it wasn't, it was like an online textbook, but it also had online assignments along with it. But that was almost $200 just for like a six month subscription. And that was the only subscription you could possibly get. So. So are biology books or science books still like the most, most, most expensive books to get on campus? I say yes. I was a science major for semester, so I had to buy. I actually bought a book. I they did uh, not need for physical edu uh, physical education, so it was kind of it was kind of weird. But like I, from what I know, like most of the science majors, like their books are like very expensive, and it's like like overly expensive. I know my liberal arts book was pretty expensive as well. It was like a hundred dollars, like hundred ten dollars, and like I we only really read like fifteen pages out of it. And then like we were highlighting and everything too. So like I couldn't really, you know, like try to sell it to somebody. So it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like shot yourself in the foot kind of. So, so we're talking about books and we're talking about classes. So how does the students, I know every school is different. How do you guys uh, select classes? When does that take place? Cause students ask me that all the time. Um, for Kutztown, the first semester, the advisor picked your classes for you. Um, so basically most of my classes were like 100 level classes and they were like basically all your gen, well, some of your gen eds. And then the second semester, sorry, sorry my dog is barking, but. Um, <laughs> she heard a car go by and she like barks at everything. 
But for the second semester, um, you are basically on your own. Um, we had like, based off your major, you had um, like a spreadsheet of all the classes you have to take over the four years. So you pretty much just went off of that. But it's very difficult trying to pick your classes because everyone's trying to get into that same class. And like, um, I know at Kutztown, depending on when you pick your classes, depending on how many credits you have. So we kind of went last because we were freshmen. So I, there were times where I wanted a class and I wasn't able to get that class because um, it was all filled up. So it was kind of the sucky part, but. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I like, yeah, same thing. I, I took a lot of entry level classes first semester, but second semester I was able to pick more of my classes and you know spread my schedule out a little bit. Now with being an athlete also, you have to have certain classes scheduled in certain places because we have sometimes we have practice at five or you might have lift at three, and, you know, miss a lift and, you know, practice are unacceptable. So it's kind of tough because like if you, you know, if you need a Monday, Wednesday at 12 o'clock or 1230 and it's full, it's like you kind of have to like bite the bullet and, you know, like take that, take that L. So it's like kind of getting in early. Like as soon as your advisor emails you or, you know, you get that email from one of the school officials that, you know, course selection is open, take advantage and, you know, select your courses and meet with your advisor. Because even if you meet with them, you still have like my school specifically, you have to go in and put the courses in and then they have to approve it. So like even if you take like you could take an extra day or, you know, extra 30 minutes and, you know, your class might be taken and within that uh, short period of time. Okay, um, so, oh, sorry. I, Penn State, since it was my first year, was pretty much during COVID. So I guess like that kind of has a whole different process. But for me, I had or, orientation day. So they kind of introduced it, all the websites, everything. And until you were completed, I believe it was like maybe 16 hours, you were able to then meet with your advisor and select your courses depending on your major. So it's like PSU bulletin. So if I go in for engineering, they have a suggested academic plan for each of your four years, depending on how many courses you're supposed to take, credits, classes, levels, everything else. And that's pretty much what I use to pick my classes for the second semester. And due dates, well, they're kind of different, like um, late drops, everything that's kind of different, I believe in each different school. Some has fees, some don't, but Picking classes is not really that hard. It's just all about communicating with an advisor. Yeah, I would definitely look at like your school's website to see if they have like Yukami and Jamie have mentioned. Like um, they usually give out like a plan um, of like, if you're this major, these are the classes that you should take. And then I would go, I guess your first semester, I would take um, like Gabby mentioned, like some gen ed classes, um, just in case like you end up switching majors, you don't like, you didn't waste a semester. Um, so I would like look into that. And then, yeah, for us, um, each like year has a specific time that they're allowed to um, register for classes. And like almost everyone is on their computer, like exactly like at the, like the second that it opens. So I would definitely um, like set a reminder to when registration opens because classes do fill up. All right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hamil, uh, what's the process at Maco and can you also explain what Gen Ed is? Yes, so um, I was just gonna explain that. So for those who aren't really uh, aware of college lingo, Gen Ed means general ed or general education courses rather. And those are typically your, um, you know, intro level Englishes, readings, maths, um, possibly even some of your uh, intro social sciences like psychology, anthropology, sociology. Um, so when it comes to Monco, Monco, um, you are required to meet with an academic advisor first. Um, so part of the admissions process is um, assisting you with the steps 
required prior to meeting with an academic advisor. The ultimate goal is to um, get an appointment on schedule with an academic advisor. And then once you meet with that academic advisor, they'll be able to um, get you registered for the upcoming semester that you're interested in enrolling in, and then kind of lay out a plan for you. So for example, um, as many of the, um, some of the old heads had alluded to, um, you may have a plan provided for fall. You may have a plan provided for spring. You may have, um, four or five courses planned out in each of those semesters. And then you could even think um, beyond that for, um, so I'm thinking, for example, um, anybody who's looking to graduate um, pretty soon, you could have fall 2022, spring 2023 planned out, and then even fall 2023 and spring 2024 planned out. Um, and you know that's for students who kind of want to um, put everything on the schedule so that way they know what to expect well in advance. Oh, that's some fancy high tech stuff there. All these different charts and and guides and things like that. Um, so guys, just make sure again, everybody seems like their process, you know, differed a little bit. So you want to check with your advisor, or if you don't know who that person is yet, talk to the admissions officer that you've been talking to at the school that you're going to to find out when registration is. So another question that students ask, and I know when I moved on campus and my sister and some other friends, people always brought too much stuff to, to campus. So how do you decide, uh-oh, 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 how do you decide what to bring to campus? Well, I was a victim of, like, I was guilty of that. I brought my entire room with me to college. So my first room, I was living with a roommate. So like I had enough space for everything. But when I moved into a single living by myself, like I was like, I found myself like looking at stuff like I didn't need it. And so it's just like, honestly, so for me, I'm local. So I kind of should have just like left a lot of stuff that just, you know, took and grabbed. But it's just bring your essentials, you know, the things that you are going to need, especially if you're going, you know, further away from school, I mean, from home and you can't get back. And, you know, your parents aren't going to be able to, you know, get there just like that. Take your essentials, you know, make a list. You know, a lot of schools send out lists. You can also Google it. Like Google is, and YouTube are really, really, really good tools to have. Like, especially if you don't, you know, have anybody in your life to, you know, talk about college and stuff, which I really didn't. So I had to, you know, figure out a lot of stuff from coaches and stuff and order, you know, teammates. So it's just pack your essentials and, you know, follow the list that the school gives you. And, you know, you're going to want some stuff from home. So, you know, bring some stuff, but don't go overboard. Trust me. And I know uh, Beatrice is far away. Well, not far away, but you're about an hour, hour and a half. Well, I guess everybody's pretty much an hour, hour to drive, right? Okay. So you, you can go next since I <laughs> said your name. Um, yeah, I was act I'm actually like, like two hours away. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't too bad for me. Um, but I did end up going home like every other week, every other weekend and every other weekend I came back with something to my dorm. So at the end, like at the beginning, I had like a reasonable amount of things. But by the end of the semester, like I just had so many things and it was like so hard to organize it. So I would one if you're able to go home, just make sure like to only bring what you really need. Um, I would also have like food in my dorm, but like you really, I never like actually ate it. So I would stay away from food since like, well, I lived like, across from like a Wawa. So if I needed like a snack, it was there or we had like certain things um, like late meal or uh, different like um, dining halls. So I would make sure to like look at like which like, where your room is and in relation to where your room is like where you have food nearby because I wouldn't like take up space with food I feel like that kind of just gets in the way um I was guilty of bringing way too many clothes um so when winter break happened I brought all my stuff back and then had to like go back and it was a whole mess um but before I started college like i was the one who like looked up videos and like YouTube videos and searched up like oh what to bring to college and like all this stuff um but then I actually found myself like 
um, stuff I was using on the daily, like I would write down in my notes on my phone, like my toothbrush or my charger, you know, like basic stuff like that, that like I use every day, I would just write down to make sure that I brought it with me to college. Um, I forget who said it, but someone said that a lot of the colleges do um, give out packing lists. Um, definitely take that into consideration because a lot of things on there, I definitely brung. Um, but just going online and searching like things that you need to bring to college. Um, the one major thing is because I didn't have AC in my dorm is to bring a fan. I must have had like six, me and my roommate having six fans going on at once when we first moved in because it was way too hot. So definitely recommend bringing a fan. <laughs> So I lived through all of my uh, fellow peers experience. Um, so when I had graduated from high school, I attended Montgomery County Community College. And many of the friends that I made there um, either came from other four-year institutions like Shippensburg, Bloomsburg, Westchester, et cetera, um, or they had friends who were in those schools. Um, so when I would get invited to those schools at Monco, um, you know, I would get a feel of their dorm room, um, kind of see what they had, um, they kind of shared with me, just bring like the bare necessities. Um, and then half the time, the friends that you make in college, they'll be able to kind of like pitch in and help out here and there with certain things as well. Um, or, um, you know, you set up very specific uh, dorm room agreements with your um, roommate, um, like what can be shared, what is totally off limits, um, you know, that sort of thing. So uh, fast forward to when I went to Westchester University, um, you know, I had some friends who um, had some of the higher meal plan options. Um, some of them had even like unlimited um, like meal swipes. Um, so they would offer me or allow me to use that card sometimes, you know, when I needed to grab a meal, but like I was out of meals or um, whatever the case may be. So networking could be one of your best friends in determining what you need, what are the bare necessities um, at college as well. And um, you brought up something really important because um, you were in community college and some of the guests that we have live here will be attending a community college. And so um, there's gonna be no campus experience there as far as staying on campus. And so those campuses have you know, spots that everybody can hang out and make themselves comfortable. So can you guys give some advice for students who will be commuting to a four-year college um, or your college uh, what advice would you give your friends about commuting as far as what they can do to make themselves comfortable? Because there is a lot of waiting time in between classes sometimes or uh, trying to figure out what to do when special events are going on. So with commuting, like to past time, I have, I have a couple of teammates that commute. So usually like, they'll like, we have this area called the uh, McCaffrey, McCaffrey Lounge. It's like a big, like, big cafe lounge area you know, chairs everywhere. you got the little, you know, cafe where you can order your food and just like kind of sit and do your work. We also have the Griffin's Den, which is like, you know, a little quick pick up and go like uh, lunch, breakfast, dinner. And, you know, there's chairs and, you know, pool table and stuff. We have different areas where like people can pass time, you know, the gym, you know, some people want to work out real quick. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a couple spots, you know, we have a lot of outside, you know, scenery. We have outside seating for, you know, lunches and stuff. So there's there's a couple of places you know at Chestnut Hill that are that are really nice, but commuting like especially if you're like me like commuting would be very beneficial like especially if you're local around the area because you you know know how to you know operate and maneuver. Anyone else have the, okay, great. Um, what I would do and something I found really effective for me was between in between classes, instead of like going back to my dorm, which meant that I was just gonna stay there. Um, I tried to like find, well, I'm like, there are several, like like Jamie mentioned, several sitting areas, several libraries. Um, and I would make a list of like small assignments or like small like tasks that I could get done in between classes. Um, so like sometimes I would get a snack and like try to like look through my emails or like clean out my emails or something like that. Like just something small in between classes. So you one are doing something productive, but like aren't bored. Um, so yeah, I found that really effective for me. 
Okay. I would go on to add, uh, my bad, my bad. Um, I would go on to add um, in between free time, in between classes, in between, um, for example, if you arrive on campus early, um, you find a parking spot because usually that tends to be an issue as a commuter um, where, you know, you have to get to, to the campus early to find parking. Um, so in between that time, I would say look into joining a club, look into joining an organization, join a fraternity or a sorority, um, get involved on campus somehow, some way. I would even extend that into looking into jobs on campus. Um, when I was, in, when I was uh, at Westchester University, my first year at Westchester, I had to commute um, because I couldn't afford to live on campus. It wasn't until I applied to an RA position and was accepted in it um, where I was able to live on campus because as an RA, a resident assistant, um, they typically provide you with free rooming and sometimes even board. Um, so rooming and room and board are two different things. Um, room is your actual room and then board is typically your meal plan, um, how you plan to sustain yourself. Um, so sometimes it's included in a package at Westchester. It wasn't unfortunately. So that's kind of why, you know, I needed to rely on some friends and be like, Hey, you got an extra meal swipe that I could use or what's up? Like you got some food. <laughs> so Yes, definitely take full advantage of um, those free times in between class, before class, during, or afterwards. All right, so I have a random question that a student asked me yesterday, and it's two words, credit cards. What are your thoughts, credit cards? So I, I don't, well, in college, I didn't really, like, deal with credit cards, but, like, growing up like through high school like my mom like educated me and my older brothers they educated me on like you know credit cards and even like i think miss mrs schaefer uh senior year she actually uh the end we had a project that we had to do which was kind of like you know balancing life like the real world like being an adult like you had the budget you know budget your food your car expenses you know stuff like that so i kind of learned a little bit you know through that but you know like with credit cards and stuff, it's just like asking, this is all about asking questions, you know, like ask questions, like with everything in college, because nobody's gonna baby you in college anymore, just because, you know, you're having a bad day or, you know, you failed a test, you know, if you have questions about stuff that are uh, specifically important, like a credit card, you know, ask questions, you know, ask, you know, trustworthy people, ask your parents, you know, ask any advisors you trust, even like, you know, ask any, you know, older uh, students at the school because they'll be able to help you. But always ask questions because you do not want to be left out of the loop at all. Anybody else have any comments or advice about credit cards? Because we all know that these credit card companies come up to the campus, they put their table out. Um, well, this is what they did when I was in school 5,000 years ago. They had a little tablecloth and they would give you stuff. They would give you uh, coupons for stuff, give you some food, give you some water bottles so that you can fill out this credit card application. And we filled out those credit card applications. I didn't, but a lot of my friends did. So get real. Um, so I know at Kutztown, I personally didn't do this, but I know a lot of my friends did. I have a debit card so I use that but I know if you signed up like certain campuses have like their own banking systems um I forget what ours is called but you could sign up for it and you would get like a hundred dollars free like already into your account if you signed up for it and like they were all over campus and it was very convenient for students like if they had to take out money there was an ATM like on campus, like everywhere you went. Um, so it's definitely convenient. Just spending wise, I definitely spent way too much money just on like coffee and snacks. Um, I know also included with my meal plan, we got like $150 worth of like flex dollars, which you could basically use on campus to like get um, like coffee, snacks, and like use it towards whatever, Chick-fil-A, whatever. Um, but depending on what college you go to, I would definitely look into um, like the baking system and see if you can sign up for some kind of deal. I would go um, 
at, online and, you know, as many of the old heads have stated, do some research, um, YouTube, Google, um, compare and contrast the different credit card options out there because not every credit card is the same as the next one. Um, some have different perks, some have different requirements. Um, some have special uh, wording, and you know, re if you read between the lines type of thing. Um, <clears throat> so you want to find the, the one that's best for you as a um, as a, an introductory credit card. Um, and then at the same time, you don't want to spend more than what you than what you're bringing in, you know, because that's how you end up with a deficit. Um, so you always want to, as one had alluded to keep track of everything, you know, it's, it's literally budgeting. Um, so just keep that in mind. Don't spend more than what you bring in because um, that's how you end up in debt. And then um, also um, try not to uh, rely on it for um, everything. Um, use it only in, in sparing situations. And then as you find yourself getting more disciplined, disciplined with it, um, then you can kind of, you know, begin um, incorporating different expenses with it. Um, for example, my credit card I use to pay off um, utilities and things like that. Day-to-day um, -day, like actual expenses. Um, and in the long run, you'll see that'll help your credit build itself. Yeah, I personally don't have one because I don't have a job. So unless you have a job, I would stay away from credit cards because if you can't like pay it, then that's when you like start getting into trouble. So if you don't have a job, I would stay far away from credit cards. And I would just add on to that, even if you do have a job, try to avoid getting a credit card unless you absolutely have to. Because it's just so tempting to, you know, oh, okay, we're going to dinner. I got you, swipe. I got your snacks, swipe, or you're buying something. Oh, I'll get two of those, swipe. And then next thing you know, you know, your credit card bill is two, three hundred dollars, and you know, you're trying to pay the minimum on that bill. So I would try to avoid it unless you actually have to. I know some of you guys may have a joint credit card with a parent that has a small balance on it, then they're trying to help you build your credit. You know, that's another thing. But I would try to avoid them unless you have to get one. Were you shaking your head, you kind of add something or are you just shaking your head? Okay. Um, so I know we only have a few more minutes because time is going by fast. Um, great conversation. So I probably have about two or three more topics to bring up and then we can actually wrap up our session. Um, what do you guys uh, experience or thoughts with summer orientation? Most colleges have some type of summer program or summer orientation so that you can, you know, get some more information about the school. So for those of you who have participated in summer uh, orientation or have friends that did, what is the benefit of doing summer orientation? Um, the benefits are honestly, you, you're kind of ahead of the game. You're ahead of the ball, like really partake in all the summer activities and all of the orientation, like moving weekend activities, because I missed a lot. Like I, you know, I always talk a lot about mental health and stuff. So, you know, I always, you know, caught myself taking little breaks from, you know, the orient, like I didn't go to, I went to one orientation thing. And the rest, like, so the most of the semester, I was, you know, out of the loop. I didn't know what was going on. So really take advantage of, like, any programs that your university or college is offering because they're really beneficial. Like, sometimes I knew, like, in high school, like, I seen some things and I was like, okay, I'm not going to go to that. And then, you know, kind of backfired. So, like, now that I'm in college, it's like, okay, I know what I did was wrong. So now it's, okay, let's take advantage of, you know, all of the resources and things that are, you know, being given to you, you know, for free. Anybody else? I would take advantage of them. I mean, I think I wouldn't necessarily go to all of them because it is also like your last summer before college. And I feel like maybe every every other summer after, like while you're in college would be a bit busy. So I would take advantage. Like also rest your first uh, summer before, but um, I think they're really helpful in like getting to meet your class because once you're on campus, you uh, know you will know at least some people, 
Um, so it's nice for that. And it also just helps you like feel like you're in the loop as Jamie mentioned before. Yeah, you, you kind of do want to enjoy your summer. So don't go to all of them, but yeah, like go to the ones that you know that will be really important. But I like to enjoy my summer. Like I, I remember during finals week, I was so excited like the next day to like be able to sleep in and not be able to wake up at eight o'clock to go to a final. So yeah, definitely, you know, enjoy your summer, but take some of the programs and, you know, take some of them serious because they, they might help you, you know, when you're in a jam. Um, so we didn't really have like a lot of like summer events. We had like a welcome week the first week that we moved in where a lot of the events took place. Um, but I actually met up with my roommate during the summer orientation. Like we all had to like pick a day and pick a time. Like it was just, it was scattered. Um, but basically I met up with my roommate and we actually met a couple other friends who like we ended up hanging out when we did get to college. Um, and just like, because you get you get broken up for us at least you get broken up into um your college so I was college of education so I met like the secretary and you know like the head of the department and like like networking that like really um will help in the end because it's like oh hey I met you during summer orientation now she might not remember you but that's okay but the fact that like you remembered her is going to be like a big thing in the end um but um just networking it's good to go don't skip it um so yeah I technically had two parts of orientation so my first one was during June but since it was COVID it was all virtual and when I moved in in August it, they had like activities and then the next day it was orientation all over again so they kind of separated us into groups and they have, I believe, like team leaders. So they actually, they're like students. They're not like grown adults, they're students. So they go over through the whole system with you. They walk you through each building where your classes are going to be. So since I'm on a small campus, it's not really hard, but compared to like the actual main campus of the UP, there's so many more buildings and each building is different. So I think it's good because you meet people within like different majors and you might meet someone within your same major and can help each other out with classes. But it's also a way to just kind of explore the area, get out of your comfort zone, meet new people and just get to know how everything else works around because it's completely different compared to high school. All right, so we're gonna um, move on to the next topic very quickly. Guys, make sure when you go to campus that you also familiarize yourself with some new terminology. So we're not calling our teacher teacher. We're calling them professor. Professor, you can't call them teachers. If you're going to pay your bill, you're going to the bursar's office. They still call it bursar. And then if you're going to take your classes, you're going to the registrar if you have some questions about scheduling. And then your advisor is a fancy word for guidance counselor. And are there any other terms that I missed so that they won't get embarrassed um, that they need to know? Any other terms? Dean. Yes. And what is the dean equivalent to? What does the dean do? So a dean um, has a, a couple different roles. Um, so for example, you know, you may make dean's lists um, where you got really good grades one semester or for an entire year. Or you could be on academic probation and have to have a meeting with the dean. Um, so the dean can be there for ups and downs. Um, the dean is typically um, someone who is either the head of the entire student body and services the students themselves and or it could be a dean of a particular program as you have heard before um, maybe there's like a dean of education a dean of business a dean of um, science etc um, you may have somebody that is in charge of um, all uh, student academics in that particular program and or major 
Okay, so that's great. So guys, just make sure that you pay attention to those terms and don't call your teacher. Teacher is professor. They get very offended by that, especially the people who have doctorates, right? They want to get that, that special recognition. Um, the, the last two topics I wanted to talk about is your family, your friends. How do you guys deal with making new friends on campus? And at the, on the other end, how do you deal with the people that you left behind at home as far as whether you're being homesick or people are giving you pressure because they keep calling you because you have things to do? Uh-oh, Jamie has a lot to say about so, it. Yeah, so being, being, even being 20 minutes away from home, like I found myself talking to my mother every day. Like that's, I felt like that's my best friend. So like I would talk to my mom every day and it's like she's like you know you're only like 20 minutes you don't have to call me every time so you know and i can't really speak of being you know further away but you know being close you know like being on a smaller campus you know you see the same people every day like i like i was like i went to one of my buddies and was like i see the same like 10 faces every single day and it's like okay then you start to you know okay let's go you know say what's up say hi and, you know being a part of a team you know you already have that you know friendship so you know it's it's nice to have you know friends and then have those friends branch out and you know meet their friends and you know and, and networking is really big in college like i was taught that you know from one of my coaches you know they would always say network like get and make as many connections as you can because you never know down the road somebody might need you you might need somebody and, you know it's always good to, you know you know have a you know circle of you know great solid people so you know just you know you know don't judge a book by its cover because there's been plenty of times that has happened on campus where, you know, you see somebody and it's like, oh, I don't, I think they're, you know, this type of person, so I don't want to be friends with them. You know, be open, you know, be open to everybody because it's a new experience, uh, you know, you're a freshman, you know, meet other freshmen because, you know, they're new too. So yeah, just, you know, be friendly. All right, I'm going to ask um, Beatrice to go next because she does have to go and leave us. So. Um, if you can give your your best advice about making friends or um, making yourself comfortable on campus and also your your friends and family that you left at home, how do you interact or deal with them? Yeah, I would definitely say to like try to at least like keep in touch with them because I feel like sometimes when I would come home, like I wouldn't even be on campus for like super long. I, could, I would come home like every like other week, so every two weeks. And I felt like something new was always happening at home. Um, so it kind of makes you feel like a little bit like left out of the loop. It's like, oh, like so much is happening while I'm away. So I would definitely like, like try to um, like have like, not a schedule, but be like, oh, like I can call you, you know, every, you know, this day or try to try your best to keep your communication. Cause I feel like I'm, I wasn't very good with that uh, at, at first. Um, and then as far as like making friends on campus, I think clubs are like a good way to start, but also like within your own classes, because for me, I worked with um, the same like two or three people throughout the year because we took similar classes. Um, but as Jamie mentioned, networking is like really important because sometimes we would be working on like a certain pro problem set and like the three of us couldn't figure it out so we had to ask a friend of a friend kind of thing and it's like oh like you know so and so knows how to do it and then um be able to like help each other that way so definitely try to like network but also when you are like working with other people it is much more efficient to work with like smaller groups like it's not realistic to work with a group of five people um to like a study group like that's not realistic at least for me so I would definitely keep your study groups small um you know two or three people max and then if you really do need more help then a bigger group is the way to go so awesome i just wanted to say uh to beatrice because i know you have to go thank you so much for coming on and and lending your advice and uh enjoy your summer and get ready for your second semester so thank you thank you thank you thank you and so Gabrielle, you kind me, I know y'all have some good advice because I've spoken to both of you um, since you left and or talked to some of your friends. So go for it. Give us the scoop. Give us the tea of how to make yourself comfortable on campus and deal with your family and friends. 
So in the beginning, I really had bad separation anxiety. So I would call my parents, especially my dad, every day. Sometimes I would even cry on the phone because I really felt left out on campus. It's really hard trying to socialize in a whole new environment, especially during classes and everything else. I think what helped me the most, I got a job. So not only did I had people at my job to like talk with and socialize with, but I also made friends on campus. So I knew I had connections just not in one place, but everywhere else. And with home, eventually, like I started, like I would even go home every weekend. I would make my dad drive up and pick me up, take me back home, drop me off on Sunday. I just kind of started distancing myself in a good way. So I'd make my goal is to call home every three days just to check up. Hey, I'm fine. You're fine. That's it. Go home like maybe once a month and just spending weekends on campus, like going out with friends, like maybe going out to eat. I found it very helpful. It's Tully's. It's a cafeteria. And it's surprising if you sit there alone, the amount of people that would just sit down with you and just start a random conversation. And that's what I started doing. So if I saw just a random stranger, but hey, don't mind if I join you. And then you make a new friend like that. So I guess just getting out of your comfort zone and just being confident and just being who you are, it really helps a lot. Um, so going off of that, I definitely had really bad separation anxiety. Like I probably called my mom every single day and like my roommate went home a lot on the weekends. So um, when she went home, I was kind of like in the room by myself. And the first semester, I didn't really have a lot of friends. I maybe had like one or two friends because I'm not a very social person. I don't really like putting myself out there. So it's definitely hard. Um, but then I also have to remember like everyone's in the same boat as I am. Um, a lot of the hall that I did live in was a freshman hall. So I had to remember that I did have people like in the hall that were staying on campus that, you know, I could reach out to. Um, I left my door open a lot and a lot of people would just like stop in and say, hey, like if you need anything, especially like that first week. Um, but I joined my hall council and so I made a lot of new friends that way. And I, second semester, I really started hanging out with them more and like, I'll be like, hey, do you guys want to meet up at like Starbucks or something? And like, we'll go and we'll just sit there and just do homework. Um, still. I mean, even second semester, like I only hang out with like two or three friends, which is fine. Like, you know, you don't have to have like all these different friends. Um, just knowing that two or three people have your back and like, you know, can always hang out with you no matter what. Um, but it's okay to be by yourself at times. Like you don't always have to be with someone. And I think that's what I have to like keep reminding myself of. Um, but it was also kind of hard because my roommate made friends right off the bat and so she had like a group of friends she hung out with the whole entire year and I was kind of just like oh I kind of wish I had that um but definitely joining new clubs and the second semester I put myself out there like you call me said with the cafeteria at um class I'll just go into an extra random person be like hey how are you? What's your major? You know, like all that stuff so kind of putting yourself out there is definitely a big thing um uh, it definitely got me out of my comfort zone. You know, I left my door open in the hall and people would stop by. Um, but I highly rec recommend joining a club on campus, though, because that'll get you far. Because my DR was my advisor and he was like really nice and I loved him. And um, that got me close to our building director and just like networking that comes into play because, you know, he could, you know, write you like a, he wrote me like a letter of recommendation down the road for a scholarship. So, um, but moral of the story, it's your first semester is going to be hard. When I came home, everyone at work kept asking me, how was your, how was your year? And I was like, well, it was an adjustment. <laughs> um, so it's definitely going to be hard, but you have to remember that everyone else is in the same boat as you are and um, kind of just putting yourself out there and going to events and joining clubs are going to help you in the long run. All right, awesome. So before I ask the last question, the last uh, question would be for um, Mr. Hamil. Um, make sure also, if you are a student that is a special education student and you have an IEP, which is an individual education plan, or you have a 504 plan for medical reasons, or you need tutoring, or you need help with writing. There are services on campus for all of you guys. So do not be too proud um, to ask for help 
You want as much help as you can get in the college setting. And remember, you're paying tuition. So you are paying for services that you need to use. So you're going to have to write papers. You're going to need help with things. So make sure you see those services, especially if you do have an IEP or 504 so that professors can be aware of what's going on with you and give you that extra assistance in class. So the last question, and you can also add on to the IEP 504 stuff too. Uh, what uh, Can you give us your advice about voter registration? Um, because um, you guys are now old enough to vote um, when you go to college, when you turn 18. And so you obviously, some of you will not be able to go home to vote depending on where you live. Um, so can you give us some guidance and advice about register, uh, registering to vote and changing your address? Of course, yes. So um, students, in many cases, on your college campus, especially when like primaries and general elections come around, you'll see tables out of people trying to get students to register to vote, right? Um, so there's a couple different options there. You can choose to register with them um, and fill out like a paper form or sometimes scan a QR code. Um, you could do that on your own time as well. For example, if you wanted to um, like Google uh, voting in Pennsylvania right now, that'll bring you up to a specific website where you could fill out the form. Now, there's um, a couple different things that you want to keep in mind, though. So because now you are away from, from home, you can technically register to vote where you are living on campus. Um, so that way you can have a say in the elected officials that are um, potentially having a major impact on your school and or even the school's finances. Um, the reason why I say that is because um, when I went to Monco, my first, my first year, and actually into the second year as well, um, there was a lot of talk of um, the state, Pennsylvania, not providing the money that was necessary to the college, therefore cutting um, services at the college and or even um, having to increase tuition to offset some of that, which would fall on us as students. Um, so that's something that you have a, a direct say in by who you vote for. Um, so that's why it's important to vote. Now, on the flip side of that, um, you can also still register to vote um, using your home address. So in theory, um, you could vote for somebody while you're living at whatever college you live at um, for somebody back at home. So that way, you know, some time will pass. Hopefully the person that you voted for will make home a little bit better in whatever instance they um, are focusing on. So that way, when you come back home, you can, um, uh, you know, take advantage of whatever changes that elected official made. However, either or um, scenario, especially if you, um, let's say you do register um, using your home address rather than your dorm address, um, you can request a mail-in ballot a mail-in ballot allows you to vote from afar. Basically, so if you're not at home and you can't go to the physical polls to vote, basically your um, voting location, if you can't go there physically, you can request a mail-in ballot. It's a lot more easier, especially now because of COVID, because many people are still using um, the reason to request a mail-in ballot specifically for COVID. So um, many of my family members don't feel comfortable going to the poll that they um, usually vote in. So they rather request a mail-in ballot just to stay safe from COVID. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. You can request a mail-in ballot well in advance, complete it, and then mail it back. And you don't have to pay for the um, stamp or anything like that. It's all pre-included in that mail-in ballot package. It gives you the steps to follow. Um, and then you put, the, en you put the, uh, the ballot in the envelope and then mail it back. All right, thank you so much for that. So we are wrapping up our Campus Connections Part 2 um, webinar course, chat, whatever this thing is. So you call me, Jamie, and Gabrielle, if you, or Gabby, in 30 seconds or less, can you give us one last tip if you have one that maybe is something that we missed or just some advice to give? Um, these students from the class of 2022 before they go off, whether they're going to campus or whether they're going to commute? Um, so my advice would basically just, you know, it's you make it how it is. So, 
you know, go to the events, even though, you know, they might sound lame or whatever. Like I went to a bingo and I really enjoyed it because I went with my friends and we had a lot of fun. So just going to events and just getting out of your dorm because you're in a small dorm room and you are going to be staring at a wall. Like, so just going out and going, having fun and just making it, you know, the best for you, say, four years that you possibly could. Okay, I guess I go next. Um, well, if anything, I would say just like getting out of your comfort zone. I think it's really important that you go to events and just try new things that you wouldn't do in high school. Because I know in high school, I didn't participate in any clubs. And going to college, I started joining clubs. And honestly, it's like the best way to actually make the best out of college. Because you meet so many people you have all these other events or sometimes that you get to go to like um, trips and they're free. So you have many opportunities just by getting out of your comfort zone. Now me, I'm really big on mental health and mental wealth. So it's just, you know, be easy. You know, the adjustment's going to be tough, but you know, and be careful who you, you know tell your business and you know, you know, who you trust because not everybody's your friend, you know, just because they smile at you or, you know, wave or, you know, go out their way, you know, they're not your friends. So, you know, it's just, you know, have fun and be safe and, you know, make smart decisions, you know, stuff like that. And it's just, I actually go out because I didn't go out. Like when I tell you, I can count on my hand how many friends I had, how many times I went out in college my freshman year, go out, have fun, you know, experience it because you don't want to look back, you know, when you're four or five years, however long is up and be like, I didn't have any fun. Like, you know, I just, you know, went to class. So, Take advantage of it because it's unlike any other experience. All right, so thank you guys for your advice. Thank our guests for um, coming and joining us on this uh, chat. And for you guys in the class of 2022, make sure you watch the video, make sure you share the video. And of course, if you have any questions whatsoever, please make sure that you get in contact with me um, and I can get you started. All right, so you guys have a great time with your wrapping up of your finals and taking those naps next week for the next week and a half. All right. So thank you guys and have a great one.